So um, I'm uh, I'm trying my the, the the costume on you know the other night, and and my my daughter comes up to me and she's like, "Poppy, your where's Walrus?" I'm like, "Waldo, Waldo." Um, and it's it's good because I'm, my my life has to some extent um, channeled a little bit of you know Waldo. It's been a little bit Waldo-esque. Um, when I was young, I had a fascination with encyclopedias. Uh, in particular, I would get stuck on the pictures. Um, and stuck's the right word because I would I'd come to these pictures and I would think, you know, what were these guys doing? You know, or why are these ladies dressed this way? Or, or you know, where's she about to go? Or why the cool face paint? Um, you see, in seventh grade, I was beginning to understand that my little corner of the world was just that, a little corner. And for me, that was unacceptable. I wanted to know more. I wanted to know people, different cultures. So I picked up a habit of wandering. And my presentation today is to really go over some of the tips that I've found in wandering the world and sharing them with you and hopefully encouraging students um, you know, to get the bug, to leave. My first tip, speak their language. I started my wanderings as a high school exchange student. At 16, Rotary International gave me a list of about 40 different countries to choose from, and I put Australia as my first. I thought, you know, hey, the language would be easy. Rotary decided to send me to Brazil. Um, Brazil is a big, big country, and instead of going to kind of one of the more famous cities like Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo, I got sent to Belém do Pará. And Belém is a city on the mouth of the Amazon River. And it's a good-sized city, but um, one of the things I quickly found out was that few people actually spoke English. Brazilians speak Portuguese, a beautiful singing language with use, which uses words like beija-flor, flower kisser, to describe hummingbird, and agua viva, or living water, to describe jellyfish. What a cool language. I quickly picked up how to speak Portuguese and learned something that was really, really key in traveling. It's very helpful to be able to speak the local lingo. When I learned Portuguese, I suddenly had a ticket to opportunity. One of the best adventures I had, and it was alluded to a little bit earlier, was when a visiting um, American professor came down to um, Brazil and uh, was there to teach a health class to indigenous villages kind of deeper in the Amazon jungle. Unfortunately, she couldn't speak Portuguese. Um, I could. So they're like, hey, great opportunity. So we got on this bus and we got on this boat, and you can kind of see right here, you, you, you you sling yourself up, you sling up your hammock, and you sleep on the boat as you chug up the Amazon River until we got to um, a nice, like, kind of one-room schoolroom, and they piled it in with kids, with students all different ages, and we proceeded to teach uh, a course on um, anatomy, believe it or not, and uh, we get to the end of it, and we do the teacher thing, you know, where you say, you know, well, are there any, are there any questions? And, and the students were just sitting there, just sort of staring at us, and very, very quiet, which is totally not Brazilian-esque. Um, and, and looking at us, and finally, there's a little girl in the back who just kind of raises her hand, and she says, what, why are your eyes that color? Um, you see, for her, um, she had never met a blonde-haired, blue-eyed American before. It was a totally unique experience for her and many of the other students there. I had been thinking in terms of how unique it was for me, but for them, it was incredible to spend the rest of the day having a conversation with us um, and being able to speak the language let us be able to connect and gain an understanding of what life was like for um, kids who live in the middle of nowhere. Next tip, join in the fun. Another way to understand people is to ask a simple question. What do they do for fun? And in Brazil, really, there's always one answer to that question is you dance. Once a year, Brazil celebrates carnival. And on the morning of carnival, my first carnival, my host family woke me up, and they fed me this huge, almost American-sized breakfast, and I was like, you know, wh what's going on? Why, why are you giving me all this food? And they're, they're like, you're going to need it. Um, you see, in Brazil, um, what they do for carnival, and I know it's a bit of a blurry picture because it's from a while ago, but what they do is they take a semi-truck, load it up with speakers, and on top they put a band. And what happens is the semi-truck slowly moves down the street, and you get behind it, 
and you, ten, you know, hundreds of thousands of folks kind of pour out into the street and you dance um, samba, lambada, fohoka, and all the local dances. It's insane fun. Um, you do this and you keep dancing and you dance and you dance for eight hours, okay? Just kind of shuffling down the street as you go, okay? And the end of the day came, and I, I really was. I mean, I think it's been the most tired I've ever been in my life. Um, but I got to see a little bit of the passion that Brazilians share for life, for dancing, and that too was a way of understanding them. Next tip. Oh, I should make a note. Um, I, I'm from the Midwest, and, and it was very hard for me to learn how to do something to get my hips to move the right direction. When it, so you can see this is my 16-year-old self learning how to try to dance. <laughs> make a friend. After college, I took a few months backpacking through Chile, Argentina, and Brazil. I traveled alone, um, which, while not necessarily is the safest way to go, um, definitely um, has the benefit of connecting with the locals, mainly because you just get so lonely for company. Um, on one leg of the journey, I teamed up with a Chilean named Carlos. Carlos was a mountain freak. It was his desire to climb as many mountains as possible. And Chile, for those of you who don't know, Chile has a lot of mountains. The mountains we decided to climb were in Parque Nacional Irikewe. So I borrowed a friend's tent, did the old hacer deos until we got to the entrance of the park, and eventually got dumped off at the entrance of the park, as I was saying, and started up a hike, 26 different switchbacks, and then going up a hill. Uh, hit the wrong button. Once we got to the top, We pitched our tents and quickly discovered a problem. No tent poles. <laughs> Always check your gear, when you're, particularly if you're borrowing it from a friend. Um, fortunately, uh, you can tell that this part of Chile ended up having lots of bamboo growing around it, so we cut off some bamboo and we kind of jury-rigged the tent so we had something you know, going over our head. Um, unfortunately, uh, that night uh, it started raining, and then it started raining for like three days. Um, so we ended up getting just sick of what we were doing and decided to go back where we, could, um, where, we, where we could be dry. So we're hiking back, and it's very difficult hiking. We should describe, like, the, the paths that we're going through are covered in mud. And I remember getting to this steep part here with, with Carlos, and he said, you know, wouldn't it be funny if we fell? Um, and he said the words, and our feet just went out from under us because it was super slick. And we go, I mean, we just go down the mountain, okay, going through the mud, getting hit by by rocks, um, the occasional cow pie. I mean, we were just, dis we were just disgusting when we get to the end. Um, and we started laughing, uh, partially, I think, because we were relieved that we were still alive, um, but also partially just because it was just, it was sort of, we looked funny. Um, and this was an important lesson because um, sometimes understanding is rooted in sharing an experience with a friend, even if it's a difficult experience, um, like having a mountain trip you up. Another tip that we've learned in traveling is serving. In order to support a habit of wandering, I entered a te the teaching profession, which, aside from being the coolest profession in the world because I get to work with such awesome individuals like you, also has this wonderful thing called summer. I married, to top it off, I married an educator, so now I had this awesome, incredible companion to come with me on all these trips. In 2003, we decided to spend summer coaching sports in a small wadi in the middle of the desert in Egypt. And here's the obligatory, you know, I'm on a camel in Egypt picture um, with my wife right here in the middle and the pyramids in the background. In between two camps, we went back to Cairo to explore part of a city called um, Makatham Hills. And I know my wife's probably thinking the Arabic came out wrong right there, but it's, it's translated in English, we, it's generally known as garbage city. Garbage City is, in fact, a city of garbage. Um, you see, the people from Garbage City, mostly Coptic Christians, go through the city of Cairo collecting trash. And they bring trash back to Garbage City and sort through it, and anything of value that they find, whether it's to recycle or whether it's to make certain crafts, um, they, they put it together to make a very, very meager living. When we entered into Garbage City, the first thing that I noticed was that you have like these apartment buildings without walls that are just filled with mounds of trash. And on one of these levels, there was a man 
um, lying there with the only thing that you could see. He was lying on his back. The only thing you could see was his head and his arms. And everything above him was covered in garbage. And every once in a while, a little kid would come by with a bucket and dump the garbage on top of him, and he'd move through the garbage trying to find something of value. And of course, there's, there's rats and there's uh, f- flies. And just, it, was, it was a very, um, you know, from an American perspective, disturbing scene. And just to give it a here, I mean, this is sort of a picture that was snapped outside of this. But you see some of the mounds of trash that would go there. Now, my wife and I were there to spend the day working at uh, an orphanage. You see, there were, so, um, there were families who lived in Garbage City who were so poor that they could not feed their kids. So what they would do is they would drop off their children at the local Sisters of Mercy so that their, that their kids can be fed. And we spent the day um, working at the orphanage and just doing simple chores and cleaning it up, those kind of things. Um, for that day, we got to catch a glimpse of some pretty extreme poverty. And that, too, had its own distinct value um, for us in understanding the world. We were pri- privileged as Americans. We're privileged as Americans, and serving is a good way of understanding that privilege. Um, yeah. Sort of the final tip for traveling, become a family. Um, this one's probably the most more personal tip that we have. Uh, over the course of a lot of different adventures, I've had a lot of friends who've opened up their house to me, so I've had, had places to stay, and likewise, when they come to the United States, um, they've had homes, my family's more or less adopted some, some fellow exchange students. Understanding other cultures and other people is possible, even easy, when looking through the lens of a relationship. Now, two years ago, uh, my wife and I got on a plane to visit another new and uh, very awesome country called Colombia. Uh, our purpose of travel wasn't to sightsee or necessarily get lost in the culture. Um, our goal was actually pretty specific. Our goal was to bring um, these two little girls home. Um, and these are our daughters. This is, this is Monica and uh, this is Kelly. And um, now you can imagine the fear and apprehension we felt as we came together as a family for the first time the stress of our first meeting together was alleviated by one very important and key activity. Bubbles, okay? Just don't ever leave home without them. They're just the lifesaver that they can be. And this is, see, this is the first time that we met Monica and Kelly, and you can see they're just being charmed by bubbles. Um, there's a word, and I honestly did not talk to Ian beforehand, but there's a word that um, w- I was going after here that my wife and I were trying to go after is, is the word empathy. Um, and empathy is this idea that you can get behind another person's um, eyes and understand what it is that they're feeling or what it is that they're seeing. My wife and I entered into a crash course of empathy with these two beautiful girls, and we tried to go behind their eyes, ask the same questions they were feeling. You know, questions like, who are these people? And why are they speaking these crazy languages? And where, where are they taking me? And, you know, what in the world is this stuff? Okay. Uh, the average temperature in um, their home city where they're from is 95 degrees, like, year-round. So coming back in January to this was, uh, was, uh, was fun. And you can see they're having fun. They're, they're, they, they, they thought snow was so much fun to eat when they got here. Um, <clears throat> I'm 34 now, and I still love to wander. I still love to channel the, uh, my inner Waldo, if you will, and just keep going and traveling. And I'm really happy now that I have two um, daughters who can come along with me. Um, and I'd like to end by encouraging you all to leave your corner of the world. Go out and explore. Go out and volunteer. Um, make new friends. Become part of different families. And have fun and learn to speak each other's language. Um, it is incredibly rewarding. Thank you. <laughs>